welcome to a special collaboration between Minneapolis Idea Exchange, MIX, and Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tony Randolph, and I'm the weekend editor and editor for new audiences with Minnesota Public Radio News. I'm also the guest moderator for tonight's forum. This event is being broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on the Nicolette Mall in downtown Minneapolis, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Tavis Smiley is an author, publisher, and social justice advocate, and host of the late night public television talk show, Tavis Smiley, and the public radio program, The Tavis Smiley Show. He has written or edited 18 books, including The Rich and the Rest of Us, A Poverty Manifesto, co-authored with friend and mentor Cornel West, and My Journey with Maya, a memoir of his friendship with Maya Angelou. He's the founder of a wide-reaching nonprofit foundation, which is committed to empowering young people and to alleviating endemic poverty across all sectors of our society. Tonight, he will help us envision a community that is equitable, inclusive, and respectful of all. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Tavis Smiley. I have only but a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, I can't refuse it. I didn't seek it, I didn't choose it. But it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but all of eternity is in it. I have only but a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, I can't refuse it. I didn't seek it, I didn't even choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but all of eternity is in it. The older we get, the more we realize how fleeting life really is. And so it behooves each and every one of us, I think, to be serious every day we wake up about maximizing the moment that we have. I want to talk about that tonight, how we maximize this moment that we've been blessed to have, given all of the challenges that we face here in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, and beyond. Um, let me commence, though, first by thanking the Westminster Town Hall Forum for this invitation, for the Minneapolis Idea Exchange as well, to all those sponsors who my new friend, I think I can call him Brother Tim, uh, my new friend, uh, Brother Tim, uh, earlier in his remarks listed all of those uh, sponsors who have made this possible. I host a television program and a radio program every day, and so I know that none of this happens without underwriters, and so I, I just have a penchant for always making sure that I take a moment to thank uh, underwriters like you uh, who make our, work, um, make our work possible. So thank you. To the mayor, uh, I'm so accustomed to, to mayors coming out, I say this with humility, I'm so accustomed to Mayor's coming out to, to say hello, to meet and to greet and to, um, to move on, to do what they have to do. And I understand that in a city like Minneapolis, there is so much more that needs to be done. And the mayor is really about to waste 25 minutes of her good time um, <laughs> to sit and listen to me. But uh, let's thank once again Mayor Hodges for her presence. Thank you, Mayor, for being here. Uh, to Tony, I thank you for your agreeing to moderate this conversation tonight. Uh, to all of my good friends at Minnesota Public Radio, as most of you know, for almost 15 years now, I've been honored to be a part of the public radio family on NPR and PRI and still do that work every day. So to Minnesota Public Radio, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for uh, recording this forum so that uh, our fellow citizens here in this great city and this great state and surrounding communities can hear uh, and be a part of this conversation. And last, but certainly not least, let me take a moment to thank those of you who are looking back at me right now. Um, there must be nothing else to do in Minneapolis tonight. Um, 
because you are packed in here tonight at this, in this beautiful edifice. This is, uh, I've seen so many photos over the years of this great edifice, but it's my first time uh, coming inside, and what a, what a gorgeous place it is to have a conversation tonight. So thank you to those of you who have made this issue important enough to put it on your calendar to come out and join with us tonight. Now to my 25 minutes of remarks uh, that I have been asked to give on the subject, no one left out creating communities of justice. No one left out creating communities of justice. I'm going to take speaker's prerogative, and since I am in a church, and since I am so accustomed in my black church in Los Angeles to my minister doing this practically every Sunday, I'm going to play the role of preacher for just 10 seconds and ask you if you will turn to your neighbor. All the black folk know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. We hear this every Sunday. Turn to your neighbor. So seriously, turn to your neighbor and tell them that justice Y'all aren't working with me. I mean this. Turn to your neighbor <laughs> and tell your neighbor the following. Justice, Justice. is what love, love. Looks, like looks like in public. Now think of what you're saying and say it one more time. Justice, Justice. is what love <laughs> looks like in public. I thought it might be best for us to start with some operational uh, definitions, definitions that we can implementize uh, before we jump too deep in this conversation, because it seems to me that if we're going to talk about leaving no one behind, no one being left out and creating communities of justice, we better start with a definition of what we mean when we say justice. And for me and for Dr. King, justice is what love looks like in public. Now, I think that begs a definition, Brother Tim, of what we mean when we say love. For me, love simply means that everybody is worthy just because. That's love. That everybody is worthy just because. Everybody is worthy just because because, not because of your surname, not because of your neighborhood, not because of your earned annual income, not because of where you went to school, not because of who you know, not because who your mom and daddy and them are, not because the kind of car you drive, the kind of hookup and access you have, none of that matters. Love means that everybody is equally worthy just because. Everybody is somebody's child, everybody is somebody's kid, and every single citizen in this city, in the Twin Cities, in this state, in this nation, in this world, every other citizen is worthy just because. I don't have the time tonight to really drill down on that thing like I want to, but imagine how our public policy in this city, in the state, in the county, in the nation, Imagine how our public policy would change right now. Put another way, imagine how our public policy would change sooner than at once and quicker than right now if we could ever operationalize that definition in our politics. Are you still with me? That everybody is worthy. Why? Just because. If everybody were worthy just because, that would mean that everybody would have access to an equal high quality education. Are you with me? If everybody's worthy just because, then everybody has access to universal health care. If everybody is worthy just because, then nobody has to live next to an environmentally toxic dump site. If everybody is worthy just because, nobody has a minimum wage job, we all have a living wage job. If everybody is worthy just because. <clears throat> and so again, when we say justice, we mean that justice is what love looks like in public. And when we say love, we mean to suggest that everybody is worthy just because. Now those are words. Our actions 
don't measure up to our language. And so we are living in a country right now, and I want to sort of echo the mayor here and expound a bit on her thesis. Let me put it this way. I believe that the greatest threat to this country right now, the greatest threat to this democracy, does not come from outside of our borders. If you listen to the politicians in Washington, and certainly here in Minneapolis with the Somali community here, you understand what I mean when I suggest that all of us are on high alert when it comes to talking about the future of our democracy and wanting to suggest or believe or to think that somehow the greatest threat to our democracy comes from outside our borders, and that great threat is terrorism. Others might think that the greatest threat to our democracy is not even terrorism from outside our borders, but terrorism dom domestically. It's hard to, to focus tonight. It is hard to focus tonight on this first day of October when just hours ago in the state of Oregon, yet another mass shooting as we sit for this conversation tonight has taken the lives of at least 13 confirmed dead, and we don't know yet how many wounded. Yet another mass shooting. So it's not even terrorism from outside our borders. We don't want to come to terms with that. Can I, can I keep it real? Yeah. Can, I, can I keep it real? The truth of the matter is that we would much rather talk about the threat from the, the threat, that is, that we, we fret about the threat. Now I sound like Jesse Jackson. <laughs> we, 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 we fret about the threat that coming, that's, that, that we believe is coming from the outside. And God knows, I don't want to, I want to be clear here, I'm not suggesting that we not remain vigilant and that we not remain diligent uh, in our duty to make sure that we protect our borders, and, and certainly we know that there are folk out there who want to do us damage, want to do us harm. But we have yet to grow up. America has grown wiser, we've grown older, but we ain't grown up yet. We've not grown up to the point where we're willing to have a conversation about what threatens us from the inside. And so every time there's a shooting, even when babies are killed in Connecticut, even when black folk are killed inside churches, God help us, when students are killed on a campus in Oregon, we still can't come to terms with doing something about guns on our streets. Somebody asked me, somebody asked me backstage before we came on what I think it's going to take for us to ever get to the place where we can have a real conversation about this domestic terrorism, this domestic threat that we seem to face far too often. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take our leaders to find the moral authority to steep themselves in courage and conviction and commitment and be willing to tell the truth about the suffering that too many have to endure because of these guns on our streets. Put another way, I hate to mix my metaphors here, but we've got to find some leaders, elected officials, who are willing to fall on the sword so we can get the guns. Somebody's got to fall on the sword so we can get the guns. Somebody's going to have to stand up with that courage and conviction and commitment born of a, of a character that says, I don't care if I don't get reelected. We're losing too many fellow citizens to guns. And the NRA, the NRA cannot continue to, to buy and boss every elected official in Washington. That just can't continue to happen. And so I detour for just a moment here because it's, again, it's impossible to not have your heart broken every time you see this happen. And for the next 24, 48, 72 hours of the news cycle, this will be the story. And everybody will decry from the White House on down, everybody will decry what has happened here. And in a few days from now, we will return to business as usual. As my grandmother used to say, and when all has been said and done, more will have been said than done. And we come back to the same place every time this happens. We'll spend all day on Fox News. Oops, did I say that? 
We won't spend all day decrying the, the international threat, the global threat. We won't get serious about this domestic threat, and pardon me, that wasn't even my point, because I don't believe that that kind of terrorism is the greatest threat facing our democracy. I want to advance to the point I was trying to make. I believe that the greatest threat facing our democracy today, I believe that poverty is the new slavery. Poverty is the new slavery. And poverty is the greatest threat facing our democracy today. And when we talk about poverty, we can't just talk about poverty in a vacuum. We are talking about poverty, we're talking about income inequality, and we're also talking about economic mobility or immobility. All three of those things have to be mentioned at once. Poverty, income inequality, and economic mobility. Too many of our leaders are willing to talk about income inequality. That's their favorite of those three choices. Every day you hear people talk about income inequality. You even have Republican candidates now for the White House in 2016 talking about income inequality. But we don't want to tackle that, that ugly, that P word, poverty. The truth of the matter is that income inequality is real, but there's always going to be income inequality. Put another way, somebody's going to always have more and somebody's always going to have less. I'm convinced, as hard as it is for me to swallow this, that I will never have the money that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have. <laughs> On public TV and public radio, it's just not in my destiny. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to achieve that. So income inequality is always going to exist. The threat to our democracy is not that some have more than others. It's that those who don't have can't have or find the economic mobility to move from their station in life to a higher plane. It's that, it's that, it's that now there, there are three distinct groups that make up the poor in this country. You have the perennially poor, you have the near poor, those who are just a paycheck or two away, and I'm certain there are some of us in this building tonight, I'm not going to look up, but I know that if the Census Bureau is right, that one out of two Americans is either in or near poverty, and by in or near, the government means just a couple of paychecks away. If one out of two of us as Americans is either in or near poverty, pardon me on the radio, I'm looking at the audience and pointing, if one out of two of us is in that situation, I think that means one you, one you, one you, one you, one you, you get my point. You start looking around this room, you start looking around Minneapolis, and if every other person is in or near, their savings are not sufficient enough to take them through if some hardship were to come, some health scare, some downturn in their employment, some catastrophic family incident, a couple of paychecks away from being poor, 50 percent of us. So you got the perennially poor, you have the near poor, and you have the new poor. You know who the new poor are? The new poor are the former middle class. The new poor are the former middle class. Those folk who look just like you in this room, just like you, who did everything right, went to school, worked hard, bought a home, stayed on a job for 15, 20, 30 years, and then one day, as nice as we like to frame this, got downsized or pink slipped, you got fired. And some corporation uh, took your job here at home by the are still making money, more money, abroad. So we end up paying the price for that. So there are folk who've played by the rules, who through no fault of their own now find themselves as part of the new poor in this country. What's your point, Tavis? That this reality is not sustainable. One percent, hear me, one percent of the people in this country cannot continue to own and control 40-plus percent of the wealth. It just can't happen. It can't continue. Put another way, the top 400 wealthiest individuals—watch this now. There are probably 400 of us plus in this room tonight. Imagine then that the 400 wealthiest Americans 
have wealth equivalent to the bottom 150 million fellow citizens. 400 individuals have wealth equivalent to the bottom 150 million fellow citizens. That is not sustainable. Uh, I hate to sound impolitic over public radio, but let me just keep it real and tell you the truth. That is not a democracy. Now, democracy. Now, you can call it an oligarchy. You can call it a plutocracy, but it's not a democracy. That is not the way democracies are supposed to work, where a few people have everything and the rest of the folk don't have anything. Nobody's hating on you. Anybody mad at you if God has blessed you? The universe has shined on you to do well. God bless you. The problem is when those scales become so imbalanced. You can't sustain a democracy like that. You can't do it in the country. Can I keep it real? Can I keep it real? You can't do it in the country in Minneapolis. You can't do it in your city. Now, let me make you, in the presence of your mayor, let me make you a little bit more uncomfortable. <laughs> we were talking before we came out, and I started asking some questions, and I regretted five minutes later that I'd ask, because the news was so disconcerting. The mayor started to share with me the numbers. I see these young people from this Kwanzaa school here tonight, these beautiful, precious black babies. Something is wrong, Minneapolis. You don't want to hear this, but I'm saying it in love. Something is wrong in this progressive city. Something is wrong when there are schools in your city that have now fallen below the achievement rate in the state of Mississippi. Something is wrong, Minneapolis. Something is wrong, progressive Minneapolis. When the white folk are doing well, and the black folk are sliding, people of color are sliding in the other direction. Something is wrong, Minneapolis. Something is wrong, Minneapolis, when the achievement gap is not shrinking but widening. Something is wrong, Minneapolis. So it seems to me if we're going to have an exchange of ideas, it's got to start with somebody telling the truth. And I can do that. I, 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 I can do that because in a few hours I'm catching a plane back home to Los Angeles. <laughs> Now, I might not be able to say this in L.A. where I have to live and work, but I can say it in Minneapolis <laughs> and, and take my behind home. But the truth of the matter is that I said to the mayor and I said to, to, to Brother Tim and Sister Tony, I said, something is wrong for those of us who, who, who look at Minneapolis as a progressive beacon of light and hope. And you start to look and drill down on the numbers and you realize, can I, can I, can I, can I keep it real? Yeah. You realize that y'all ain't as progressive as you think you are. You're not as progressive as you think you are. In your mind, you are. In your head, you are. In your heart, you are. But in your public policy, the mayor's fighting an uphill battle to talk about equity. This is what I call doing the righteous work. It's what I call doing the heavy lifting. It's not the popular uh, narrative, and it sometimes means you might not get reelected. But somebody has got to tell the truth about the suffering of everyday people. And you know why? You know why? Because if nobody tells the truth about the suffering of everyday people, then that suffering gets rendered invisible. And the worst thing you can do to people who already feel that their humanity is being walked on their dignity is being denied. The worst thing you can then do on top of attacking their humanity and, and, and disrespecting their dignity is to then render them invisible. So they get marginalized. They get exploited. They become an afterthought. And then that becomes the condition of the nation. Poverty is threatening our very democracy. Put another way, I believe, if that ain't bold enough for you, let me get a little bolder. I don't believe that poverty is just threatening our democracy. I believe that poverty is now a matter of national security. Let me link this back to the security argument I made a moment ago. 
It's not just threatening our democracy. It's now a matter of national security. Why? Glad you asked. Because these numbers are not sustainable. And at some point, uh, how might I put this? Anybody ever played Monopoly? In the game of Monopoly, what happens when one player has everything? Thank you, thank you, game over. <laughs> Do you see my point? When 1% of the people have everything and ain't nobody else got nothing, two words, game over. Game over. It works in Monopoly and it works in real life. That's why our democracy is in trouble, because you can't sustain this when the haves keep having more and the have-nots keep living with less. You can't sustain this. Now, don't run out and say that Tavis called for anarchy last night at Westminster. That's, <laughs> that's not what I said. But I'm telling you that the handwriting is on the wall. And if you think we can continue this way, with people not having their humanity respected, their dignity acknowledged, and then the hopelessness settles in, well, you're talking about a mess. Yeah. You're talking about a mess. We can't, we can't sustain that. And so here in Minneapolis, as you go forward, trying to not just profess progressive, progressivism, not just profess it, but to live it, to be it, to enact it, we have to start a conversation about the facts, about the truth, that amongst all of this prosperity, all this well-to-do, all of this advance, Brother Tim and I were talking, you know this stuff better than I do, the students in this region, in this city, have some of the highest ACT scores in the nation on one end the highest ACT scores in the nation. Somebody's kids are doing awfully well. Somebody's kids are going to the best colleges and universities in this country. Got the highest ACT scores on one end, on the other end. Students are failing because they're not being given access to an equal, high quality education. I didn't come here to Minneapolis to beat you all down. I, I, I love this city. I've been here so many times over the course of my life, and I was honored at the invitation to be here. But as we move around the country, if we're going to confront the thing that threatens us the most, I repeat myself yet again, somebody has to tell the truth about the suffering, because the suffering is increasing. And in Minneapolis, a most progressive place, I shudder to think, God help us all, if we can't get it right here, if we can't get it right here, if we can't get it right here, then where in America will we find citizens of the good conscience, of the good will, who understand that love means that everybody is worthy just because? Citizens who understand that justice is what love looks like in public. If y'all can't figure that out here in progressive Minneapolis, then God help us all. I close with the words of Martin Luther King Jr., the person I regard as the greatest American this country has ever produced. And I believe that the future of this country, our destiny, the destiny of this democracy, the destiny of this democracy is inextricably linked to how seriously we take King's legacy. What is King's legacy? Justice for all service to others, and a love that liberates people. Justice for all. This is the goal now. Justice for all, service to others, and a love that liberates people. Now, we can't accomplish those three things if we are not going to conversely, uh, 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 simultaneously rather. We can't do anything about justice for all and service to others and a love that liberates people on the one hand, if on the other hand, we aren't willing to tackle poverty and income inequality and economic immobility. So I'll leave you with King's words. Cowardice, ask, is it safe? Expediency, ask, is it politic? 
Vanity asks, is it popular? But conscience asks, is it right? And every now and then, people, good people, people in Minneapolis, have to say, it doesn't matter if it's safe. It doesn't matter if it's politic. It doesn't matter if it's convenient. All that matters is that it's right. And our individual and collective consciences tell us that it's right. Thank you very much. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tony Randolph, weekend editor and editor for new audiences at Minnesota Public Radio News, and I'm the guest moderator for tonight's forum. Our speaker, as you know, is Tavis Smiley, author, public television host, and social justice advocate. And while the ushers are collecting questions from our in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church to hear former U.S. Congressman Patrick Kennedy on Tuesday, October 13th at 7 p.m., when he'll explore the topic, Treating the Pain of Mental Illness and Addiction, a Personal Journey. Additional information on this event can be found at westminster.org. And I know you just sat down. But I'd ask you, Mr. Smiley, if you would please step back up to the pulpit, and I can present to you some questions from our audience. And uh, actually, before we get to the first audience question, I'd want to ask my own question, if that's okay. Moderator's privilege. <laughs> please, please go, go on. Yes. You, you talked about King's legacy, and you talked about poverty and income inequality and economic mobility, and I'm wondering if you think that it's possible to mount a poor people's campaign somewhat like what Dr. King did 50 years ago. Mm. It's a good question. I think that is starting to happen slowly. I believe that that movements, you're talking about a, a serious movement, and movements, as we history students know, are rare. Movements are rare, and they seem to happen this way. You start with a moment, that moment builds some momentum, and the momentum turns into a movement. A moment, then momentum, and then movement. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, Tony, so I can't tell you where we are on that, on that line. But I believe that we, uh, we have moved through the phase of being in a moment where we're starting to get traction on this issue. As I said in my talk tonight, even Republicans now are talking about the issue of income inequality. So my sense is it's going to be an issue. It's going to be a topic in this presidential uh, race. And let me say how much I appreciate Bernie Sanders. Yeah. How much, how much I appreciate Bernie for raising this issue. Uh, Hillary Clinton is a friend of mine, has been for years, and Bernie is a friend of mine. I've known the Clintons for many, many years, and I'm not so sure they were happy when I suggested some months ago uh, on national television that somebody needed to come from the left and run for the nomination. This is, a, this is an election. It's not a coronation. This is, this is, uh, this is an, it's an election. It's, it's not an auction. Uh, and so I thought that she needed to be challenged from her left, not because I don't like her, not because she's not my friend, but because I believe that, number one, being pushed from her left flank is going to make her more progressive, number one. And number two, I believe that Barack Obama became a great candidate because Hillary Clinton pushed him. And she'll become a greater candidate if she's tested in the primary. So for a number of reasons, I think that uh, Bernie Sanders made the right decision. But it's, it's most uh, n noticeable on the issue of income inequality. And because of Bernie Sanders, everybody now is talking about income inequality and poverty and economic immobility. We thank him for that. Um, but I think that uh, we are in the process now of, the, of, that, of that moment starting to build some momentum. Very quickly, we'll move on. 
uh, I have been suggesting something that I want to share with you, and if you feel the same way, then please use your social media accounts to, to raise this issue. We're using a hashtag that we just announced. It's called, it's hashtag 2016 poverty debate. Hashtag 2016 poverty debate. What we're asking for, what we're going to be, you're going to be hearing more about this in the coming months, because I'm going to be leading the campaign with others about this very issue. In the history of this country, and certainly in my lifetime and your lifetime, there has never been a single presidential debate. You know, when we get, to, when we get down to the two finalists, we're going to have the Presidential Debate Commission give us those three debates that we get every four years, right? There has never been a debate exclusively about the issue of poverty or income inequality or economic immobility. And I believe that now, Tony, is that time. That, that moment that we are in can turn to momentum if for 90 minutes the eyes of the entire nation, of all of the media, focused for 90 minutes on the issue of poverty and income inequality. And both of these candidates are then put on the record about what they're going to do if they're elected president. I believe that that moment you, you know, there, and when we talk about time, Re Brother Tim knows this, there is what we call uh, 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 Kairos and what we call Kronos. You know, Kairos, uh, 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 Kronos is, is the passage of time. Kronos is the passage of time. Things happen in time. The passage of time we call Kronos. Kairos is a moment in time, yeah. a specific, powerful, opportunistic moment in time where we can actually get something done. I believe that this can be a Kairos moment if we can get a debate where both of the candidates are focused on this issue. That moment will build to momentum. That momentum can perhaps, to your question, Tony, become a movement. And a question from our audience. What are we as a nation going to do about gun violence? What can we do at the state and or local level? The short answer is, as I tried to intimate earlier tonight, is that um, we have to have leaders who have the courage, the conviction, and the commitment um, to take a stand on this issue. Every time this happens, what we essentially get is lip service. And um, as I said earlier, we return to business as usual. Um, it's going to take leaders who are willing to stand up to the powers that be. And part of the problem is anytime you even critique the NRA, you know, you got, you got hell to pay just for critiquing the NRA because they, they, they toss so much money around in Washington and in state capitals all across the country. Um, but this is not about attacking the NRA. It's about finding a way to put some reasonable gun laws on the books and to enforce them. And I'm, I'm, I'm sick and tired, I'm, I'm like Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. Every time this debate comes up, we act like there is no ground. We act like, we, we let the NRA make the argument that there is no ground between a repeal of the Second Amendment, which nobody's asking for, and sensible gun laws. You're trying to tell me that we can't find some common ground between not attempting to repeal the Second Amendment, but wanting to put some sensible gun laws on the books, we can't find any common ground between those two polders? I just, I don't buy that. I don't buy it. So it's going to either be leaders who will take a stand, or there's going to have to be a groundswell. See, what's going to happen is this. This is the long view of this, and it sounds stupid to say, but I guess, since you asked, if the leaders don't have the courage to do it, then it's going to be a groundswell from the people. But here's the problem with the groundswell. It's going to take a long time, and a whole bunch of our loved ones are going to die in the process before enough of us who are impacted personally by gun violence decide that enough is enough. Do you take my point? I mean, does it require every one of us in our own individual families to be so afflicted and affected and demoralized by gun violence? that we then raise our voices, because that's what happens in this country. Most of us don't say nothing until it happens to us. And then we, then we get this righteous indignation. We become, become righteously indignant at that moment. But by, by that process, by that methodology, that's a whole lot of folk getting killed 
to build the anger quotient high enough where enough of us say enough is enough. And I don't know about you, but I ain't got that kind of time. This next question isn't really a question, and several people put this, these words on the cards. Black Lives Matters. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, what is your take on Black Lives Matters? They're protesting around the country and here in the Twin Cities, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of controversy about tactics used. So can you give some comments and thoughts about what you have seen with the Black Lives Matters movement? Sure. First of all, let me just say that um, in the annals of history, whether they are black lives or white lives, black folk or white folk, for those of us who are students of history, we have to admit and acknowledge that well-behaved people rarely get anything done. <laughs> <clears throat> That's, uh, ever heard of the Boston Tea Party? <laughs> ever heard of the American Revolution? Ever heard of the Civil War? Well-behaved people rarely get anything done. So enough with this conversation about tactics. I'm, I'm, I'm over that. Because what these Black Lives Matter protesters are doing by raising their voices, is trying to prick our consciences about what's happening to the lives of everyday people, happening to the lives of the most vulnerable of our citizens from California to the Carolinas. So enough of that conversation about tactics. Um, what I believe is that we owe these protesters a debt of gratitude. Yes. We, owe, we owe them a debt of gratitude. We owe them, they have, they have been a gift. They have been a gift. But if the truth be told, the best of the black tradition, the best of the black tradition is reminding America that she does have a conscience. The best of the black tradition is black people being the conscience of this country. The best of the black tradition is holding America accountable. The best of the black tradition is being a patriot. And being a patriot means that you are, uh, that, you're, that you're willing to rebuke your country when she's wrong. That's what being a patriot really means, that you love your country enough to tell her when she's wrong, to rebuke her when she's wrong, and to show her another way that she can be made better. So at the end of the day, I repeat, it's not so much about the tactics because, again, you have to get in the way. You really have to get in the way to be heard, to make a contribution, to make a difference. What's more important for me is that we start to pay attention, that we listen to the message. We get so caught up with methodology sometimes that we miss the message. And sometimes in our politics, we get so wed to ideology that we ignore good ideas. And I believe that they have some good ideas. And I believe that their, uh, that their message is something each of us ought to pay more attention to. You talked about education earlier, mm -hmm. and a question, if you were superintendent of the Minneapolis schools, God, how would God, you... God help us all. <laughs> <laughs> how, would you, how would you approach the education deficit deficiencies that you've identified? Yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about the crisis specifically here in Minneapolis. I know what I read. I know what the mayor and I discussed and Brother Tim and I discussed. I, I know certain things. Um, but I really don't have to know all the facts to answer the question in this regard. Malcolm X said that education is our passport to the future because tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. If Malcolm was ever right about anything, he was right about that. Education is our passport to the future because tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Malcolm was right about that, but what Malcolm didn't even know, and what some of us have yet to come to terms with, is that in this world, racism is so real, discrimination is still so prevalent, people are becoming so much more nativist 
turning inside and blaming everybody else outside because things have gotten so tight in this economy. And so now the truth of the matter is that even with an education, a high quality education, if you look a certain way, you got a certain last name, you sound a certain way on the phone during the phone interview, you still don't get the job. Right. The data, it's not because I said it, the data researchers have laid this out. That job discrimination is more rampant than ever before because things are so tight in this economy. People are trying to hold on to what they have that we are still discriminating against people who have an education. So if you're a black man with a Harvard degree, if you're a black woman with a Yale degree, if you're a black man, black woman with a University of Minnesota degree, you still are gonna have a much more difficult time getting a job than a white fellow citizen with that same degree. So before I answer this in greater detail, it's important to understand that, that even now, we must accept that education, I hate to say this, but it's the truth, that education isn't even the great equalizer that it once was. Now, having said that, without an education, you're twice defeated. Without an education, you're twice defeated. Your race is one strike against you. Your gender is another strike against you. Without an education, you're twice defeated. So let me be clear that not getting an education is not the answer to the prayer. That's not the answer either. But I want to be clear about what happens these days even when you have a high-quality education. But to your question more expressly, it's what I said earlier tonight, and I don't need to expound on it anymore. If we believe that love means that everybody is worthy just because, I know the mayor believes that, because what she wants in this city, what I want for this city, and I hope what you want for this city, is that everybody has the opportunity to fulfill their God-given talent, that their talent will take them wherever they can go. But when the scales are like this, are imbalanced, and the achievement gap is so broad in the city. When in certain schools on certain sides of towns, you got ACT scores off the charts, and other kids who are reading from dilapidated books and fighting to get to school safely, and sometimes teachers who are less than enthusiastic about being there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's a difficult spot to be in. And so if I were the superintendent, I guess I would start with that edict that every one of these precious students, no matter what part of town they're from, what their family's income is, what their surname is, what I said earlier, none of that stuff matters. If I were the superintendent, my edict is this, my thesis is this, that every one of these students is equally worthy just because. And my job then becomes to make sure that every one of them has access to an equal high quality education. Now, how do you define, how do you define that? What does that mean, Tavis? Well, very simple. If the goal is to make sure that every student in this city has access to an equal, high-quality education, this ain't rocket science, y'all. You've picked the school in town that's the best. And whatever they have, you fight to make sure that everybody else has that same thing. It's very simple. It's simple. So it's not about, it's not about judging outcomes. It's not about judging outcomes but about making sure that everybody starts at the same place. So whatever the best school in town has, then every school in town ought to have that if we believe that all students are worthy just because. If I'm superintendent, that's my working thesis. Yeah. This is another word that's on a couple of cards, reparations. We don't really want to go there at night, do we? <laughs> <laughs> very simply and very quickly. I, um, I believe in reparations, but I don't believe in it in the way or as defined by some people. Put another way, I am not in 2015 looking for 40 acres and a mule. Uh, I'm not even looking for a check. And the truth be told, I have been blessed. I am grateful every day. Every day I wake up, I thank God that I have been blessed beyond measure. I grew up just down the road from here in a place called Indiana. Born in Mississippi, but raised in Indiana. I'm one of 10 kids. 
my mother and father and my grandmother, big mama, three adults and 10 kids, 13 of us lived in a three bedroom trailer with one bathroom, not a house. We grew up, I grew up in a trailer park, a dirt pool trailer park with 13 people sharing one bathroom in three bedrooms. My mom and dad had one bedroom. My seven younger brothers and me had the second bedroom. And my two sisters and my grandmother, big mama, had the third bedroom. 13 people in a one bathroom, three bedroom trailer. That's how I grew up. I'm the first to tell you that you can build an entire life on hope alone just on hope, just on hope and hard work, you can build a whole life, uh, a meaningful life. But even hope these days needs some help. I believe you can build a life on hope, but hope could use a little bit of help. Uh, and so uh, for me, because I've been so blessed, I'm not one who needs a check. Uh, and there are other African Americans who don't need a check. We don't need the check. We don't need the 40 acres on a mule or a Lexus or a Mercedes or an Acura or whatever it is. What the masses of black people do need, and the way that I would define reparations, are education vouchers, uh, jobs with a living wage. Uh, we could do this all day long. Universal health care. There's so many uh, uh, difficulties that black folk have to endure and encounter every day. So many maladies and tragedies that we have to, uh, again, try to deal with every single day. So there are ways to define reparations, uh, and we could talk about that all night long. But for me, it's not about a check. It's not about you know, four days on a mule, but it's about providing those kinds of services, those kinds of opportunities that black people have been lacking for so long because of the lingering effects of slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, and Jane Crow. And uh, we just have time for one more question. Sure. And a couple of people ask this too. What can one person do? Ooh, what a great place to close. I, I love that question. Um, every one of us in here tonight, as we leave, has to assign ourselves. Each of us has to assign ourselves. Every one of us in here ought to have our consciences pricked by something that we see every day, something that we walk past every day, something that just disrupts our spirit. There's something in Minneapolis that, the un that ought to unsettle your soul. This is a great place to live, but this ain't utopia. No place is. I love L.A. I live in L.A., but it's far from utopia. And so as I move around my city in Los Angeles, I see every day things that are disturbing for me that, 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 that violate my humanity, that disrespect my own dignity. Put another way, I don't believe that any of us can come into the fullness of our own humanity if we can't revel in the humanity of other fellow citizens. You will never experience the depth, the depth, the fullness, the wholeness of your own humanity if you can't revel in the humanity of every other fellow citizen. So there has to be, there has to be something that just outrages your senses that you know needs to be addressed. And whatever that thing is, I can't tell you what it is. You know what your own sensibilities are. But there's got to be something that you say tonight, I'm going to assign myself to do something about this right where I am. I'm going, I'm going to do what I can, as the old song says, Brother Tim, to, to brighten the corner right where I am. Song says, brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Some from, someone far from harbor you may guide across the barge. Just brighten the corner right where you are. Can you imagine how different, how much better our world would be if every one of us in Minneapolis and beyond tonight decided that there's one thing that's contesting our own humanity that we're going to assign ourselves to do something about? Because by any other definition, that's what racism is. Yeah. 
the contestation of somebody's humanity. Homophobia is the contestation of somebody's humanity. Ageism is the contestation of somebody's humanity. Classism is the contestation of somebody's humanity. This achievement gap that's lingering and growing is the contestation of somebody's humanity. This is what we're fighting against. How do we navigate our lives in a world, in a city, in a county, in a state where too many of us have become too comfortable with the contestation of other people's humanity? And if we become so comfortable by that, as opposed to being conflicted by it, then how then do we come again into the fullness of our own humanity? I come to King once again, that our destiny as a people is inextricably linked together. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And every one of us, I again believe, must do our part to assign ourselves to honor that legacy. Justice for all, service to others, and to espouse a love that will liberate people. Westminster, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. Tony, thank you. Brother Kim, thank you as well.